All right, so my name is Krishna, and this is my first uh, semester at ASDRP. I'm a sophomore at Mission San Jose High School, and yeah, I'll pass it on to Nathan. Hey, I'm Nathan. I am a junior at John F. Kennedy, and this is also my first semester at ASDRP. Uh, I'm Akash. I'm an 11th grader at uh, Basis Silicon, uh, uh, yeah, BISV. And this is my, this is also my first semester at ASDRP. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're happy to have, happy to have you. So I'm assuming this is your first colloquia, right? For three of you. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. So our project is identifying and isolating collimated jets from heavy ion collision open data through quantum opti optimization. So our entire project is centered around jets and um, jets are a byproduct of particle collisions and the jets we're studying are, are narrow cones of hadrons and other particles that are produced in a heavy ion collision. Um, hadrons are subatomic particles composed of two or more quarks that are bound by the strong nuclear force, which is mediated by gluons. So in these heavy ion collisions, hundreds of protons and neutrons, which are the most um, relevant hadrons to us. Um, so hundreds of protons and neutrons in two nuclei collide against one another with energies of up to 10 trillion electron volts. And when they collide, they form a quark gluon plasma, which is what was theorized to exist right after the Big Bang. So this is, this is what a particle collider aims to simulate, kind of the early conditions of the universe. So when a quark or a gluon ejects out of a heavy ion collision, it pulls hadrons and other particles out of the vacuum and becomes a cloud comprised of high energy particles called jets. These jets strongly interact with things, but they move at such high speeds and energies that they are not absorbed by the surrounding quarks and gluon, quark and gluon plasma. So we're able to detect them um, in particle colliders. Heavy ion collisions can also produce loads of other particles, such as pions, uh, protons, neutrons, of course, and the antimatter versions of these, or even light nuclei, such as helium. So why are jets important? Jets can tell us a lot about the particle collision that is happening. Jets are crucial event-shaped observable objects, which just means that they're dependent on the, the event, which is a collision, and they are used in high energy particle physics. And we can use them to determine many properties of a collision. So for example, jets are important because they're the basis of quantum chromodynamics or QCD, the theory that details how quarks and gluons come together based on the colors in heavy ion it colors which is not actual colors, it's a quantum property of these particles. In heavy ion collisions, they can also be quenched, meaning that they lose energy as they push through the plasma that is initially produced from the collision. This, is, this was a discovery by CMS at CERN, which, is, which we'll go more into later. And it, is, it, tell, it, can, if, it can tell us a lot about the early universe. Jet reconstruction is meant to recombine different, the different particles of the jets. So we, the, the particle detector, the collision detector detects all these jets and using that data, it can, it can reconstruct and uh, determine the original kinematics or the kinematics of the original collision. Although this is made harder by a phenomenon called pile up, which arises from the constant release of energies, because these particle colliders collide particles um, at high frequencies, like it'll be the hundreds and thousands at every second. So, and all that energy that's being released often piles up on the colorometers um, that surround 
or in the detector. So this is a cross-section of a um, part of, of CMS, which is one of the experiments at, at CERN. So as you can see, you can see the kind of part, the paths of the particles and these gray triangles are, or I guess they're cones, but because they're 3D, but these gray triangles are the jets that we will be studying. And the rectangles, represent the energy levels that are detected by calorimeters. All right, so what we are doing. To recap, jets are sprays of particles that fly out from heavy ion, wait, from certain high energy particle collisions. These collisions create very energetic quarks and gluons as they travel away from the collision point they emit more gluons, which can split even further. This results in a relatively narrow cascade or jet of particles, which is what we're going to be studying and sort of looking more into. And that's the part we're trying to isolate. And there are some ways to recreate the properties of quarks and gluons in a collision from the end products of jet creation and thrust. Thrust, if you don't know what that is, or the thrust axis, is an event shaped, meaning it's a statistic you can measure and observe after two heavy ions collide, and which gives collisions its properties, which basically tells you the direction the jet cones travel after collision. And this process is centered around the identification of jets from the data collected by heavy ion collisions, which is what we hope to gain information on and look more into in the near future. The heavy ion data are the byproducts of the collision, which we hope to separate from the chat. All right. Researchers at CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research at Switzerland, have mainly worked with machine learning and data visualization tools to identify the classes and flavors of jets using their properties, some of which are the types of quarks the jet could have, and from the various different color changes which actually don't have to do with the visual colors that we see. And flavor refers to the species of an elementary, um, of an elementary particle. The, stand the standard model consists of count six flavors of quarks and six flavors of leptons. They are conventionally parameterized with flavor quantum numbers, but that are assigned to all subatomic particles. Currently, we're aiming to utilize a similar but also different approach to classify and isolate jets from the heavy ion data, the byproducts, in this case, the unwarranted portion of the data. And one method is quantum annealing. And that's the one that we are gonna be utilizing in our um, sort of research. And, and this is basically just an optimization process that uses quantum fluctuations and to find the local minimum. A quantum fluctuation is a temporary change in the amount of energy in a point of space as explained by Werner Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. However, it's important to note that this only applies to quantum physics. This method has been previously useful in denoising and isolation algorithms using convolutional neural networks, which is why we aim to use this relatively novel method to study jets. And our goal. So to put it in simple terms, our team is attempting to use quantum annealing with deep learning on heavy ion collision data to identify and isolate jets from it. Yeah. Different. So just a quick note, during our research um, in the past month or two, we had to bring everyone up to speed on particle physics and quantum mechanics. So. Um, our methods are still currently in development, or and we don't have comprehensive re results yet. However, we do have an idea of what we will see as our project develops. So we are going to be using CMS LHC open data. Um, CMS was one of the many experiments that is one of the many experiments that takes place in the Large Hadron Collider at, at CERN. It, it, so in 2020, CERN released heavy ion collision data from the LHC from two, 2010 and 2011. These data sets contain various information about the thrust axis, color charges, 
and information about jet creation we need to identify jets and is contained in or it is displayed in a an AOD file format which we do need um, specialized software but it's prov provided by CERN to read um, this file. So thrust axis like Krishna said it just tells you the direction the jet cones travel um, but the color charge of quarks and gluons, that's related to the particle strong interactions in the quark color hypothesis, which basically just states that quarks have this property that we call color. Um, it is it is best understood with an analogy to like white light. So when the primary colors red, green, and blue are mixed together at equal proportions, you get white or colorless light. Um, and just like that, in had hadrons, red, blue, and green quarks will combine to create a colorless hadron particle. And, but this, um, this can only happen if their color properties are in equal proportion and will cancel each other out. So analysis of the color of quarks helps us identify the frequency and distribution of quarks following collision. And we will be using the 2010 heavy ion data set uh, to train our neural, neural network. And then we're going to evaluate our neural network on the 2011 heavy ion data set. So to obtain our data set from CERN's own archives, we will be using, uh, utilizing a platform as a service application called Docker. So whenever any developer develops a, a product, there are certain issues that occur quite often. So in this case, a product might work absolutely fine on the developer's machine but as soon as that project runs on a different machine, the project will fail to work with the same performance or optimization. So Docker essentially, uh, Docker essentially addresses this issue, or the issue it works on my machine. So Docker is essentially a software development platform that makes it easy to develop and deploy applications inside containerized environments. So that essentially means that apps run the same no matter where they are or what machine they're running on. So in this case, Docker, Docker containers can be deployed to just about any machine without any compatibility issues. So your software say, stays uh, system agnostic, which makes software simpler to use, uh, decreases the amount of work to develop and also makes it easier to maintain and deploy. Um, Docker is also a form of virtualization, but unlike a VM, the resources are shared directly with the host while keeping the operating system of the host the same. So this essentially allows you to run as many Docker containers where you might be only able to run a few virtual machines. And the way we're utilizing this in our research project is since CERN's CMS data is located entirely on a Docker instance and is listed on their open data forum as an options for researchers like us, uh, which we can use to copy over the data. We will be copying their CMS data from 2010 and 2011 over a Docker instance, which contains their uh, heavy ion data and specifically the files that we're looking for, which are AOD files. So next, Next, we will be talking about how we will essentially modify previous classification algorithms to fit quantum annealing into our uh, algorithm. And this is essentially the main objective of our research as we go on uh, throughout developing the program. And a quick note before we delve in to uh, the actual problem itself, we'll be, we will be using diagrams from Rajdeep Kumar Nath's uh, research about machine learning classification using uh, quantum annealing from real world applications in 2021. And essentially it will illustrate how we will use quantum annealing in our project and how our classification algorithm is ultimately different. So how will we use D wave quantum annealing? To classify and isolate jets from uh, non-relevant particle data uh, physicists have previously used 
deep learning and neural network classification to do this. However, this process usually takes a large amount of processing power. And with limited data, like how we have, we only have 2010 and 2011, uh, classical machi machine learning, though after iterative training might have a pretty good accuracy around 90-ish percent, uh, D-Wave quantum computing as uh, opposed to classical optimization methods actually shows how classical machine learning is not a very fast option. And this is where actually D-Wave quantum annealing comes into factor. And D-Wave quantum annealing, as opposed to classic methods, utilizes principles of quantum mechanics. Mostly we're going to be talking about superposition and entanglement to optimize an algorithm by comparing the energy states of 0, 1, and 0 1 qubit states as shown in the diagram. So in this case, in A, B, and C, all of the local minima in this case are actually results of different states of a, the qubits that we use in D-wave quantum annealing. And this special property of quantum particles allows us to optimize our machine learning algorithm in a faster and more efficient way. And this allows us to train better under limited data, uh, reduce training time, and generalize our train model to our test data in a better way. Uh, so this diagram of a standard classification model shows the process of solving a normal classification problem. So in this diagram, the available data can be separated into two parts, of which one part is the training sample to build and train the classification model, model and the other is the testing sample that contains all of the data to be classified. And so for the data in the training sample, the labels are first determined by pattern analysis or actual labels that we provide uh, to distribute all the data into several categories. And then the features that can describe the characteristics of different categories are also extracted. From a modeling perspective, classification requires a training data set with many examples of inputs and outputs from which to learn. So essentially, we will be sort of utilizing a similar data set and labels to uh, classify these types of things that we're looking at when we're studying jets. So uh, a model will use this training data set and will calculate how to best map this example of input data to each specific class labels we provide. And as such, the training data set must be pretty representative of the problem and have many examples of uh, class labels. And when you're, for, for an example, uh, class labels are sometimes string values or, or, or uh, binary numbers. So in this case, or in this example, uh, if you were classifying emails as spam or not spam, spam and not spam are labels and they must be encoded to values of zero and one, but in our case or in our research, our labels will be dependent on two ideas. Uh, one of them is the classification of a group of particles being a jet or a non-jet or anything else that is not a jet. And number two, the type of jet, heavy, either heavy flow or light flow jets that are resultants from different quark interactions. And as I said before, classical machine learning has a lot of problems when you're looking at or studying jets uh, in the case of heavy ion experiments. And this computational challenge sort of limits the ability of models to train e efficiently, especially in the presence of okay. a large number of variables. Uh, so to, to, to deal with this problem, researchers and also physicists have been exploring alternative computing techniques such as, in this case, quantum computation to augment the power of machine learning uh, algorithms. And quantum computing is inherently suited out to carry extremely complex computations, which is either very, very slow or not possible using classical computation. And quantum computing processes information in the form of qubits or quantum bits that can represent values of zero, one, both zero and one, 
and qubits can also be entangled with another, which is, which explains why computation with, uh, with with qubits is way faster. And essentially, what we will be doing with our original classification model that I showed previously is replacing the optimization sort of function or the function that looks at the loss over time and tries to optimize the loss so that we actually have an efficient algorithm and replace this optimization algorithm with uh, quantum annealing, which is a form of optimization using qubits. So in this case, we will be creating a, re a relatively new sort of form to quickly look at all of the data provided by CERN CMS 2010 and 2011 and speed through it while classifying each and every single sort of particle or groups of particles that we see as jets and on jets and then taking those jets and classifying those as heavy flow or light flow jets. So essentially that is what we're trying to do in our research and that is what we have come up with so far. Also, uh, before we end off our presentation, or at least what we have as our comp comprehensive methods and no results as of now, but we're planning to have a code as well as results uh, by the end of May or June, uh, 2022, uh, we would like to thank our advisor, Larry, Larry McMahon, or, uh, who helped us a lot in the case of actually replicating Docker instances as well as as well as particle physics in general, and all of our ML2 group research researchers, uh, such as Na uh, Nathan, uh, Krishna, Yasha, and uh, and all of us essentially, and also we would like to thank ASDRP and the computer science and engineering faculty uh, for the opportunity itself. Okay, well done. Um, I mean, the proposal looks very promising. Um, however, um, do we have Docker at ASDRP server? Uh, currently, we are we are not using Docker at the ASDRP sort of uh, server grid. We're actually mm -hmm. downloading Docker desktop on our computers and replicating it from CERN's like instances that they have at their facilities. So the way that we're planning to use ASDRP's um, sort of like uh, devices that we have at ASDRP is for quantum annealing, we're gonna require quantum computers. And since- That's what I was going to ask. Like, uh, that's a second question. Now, what do you wanna do with quantum computing? <laughs> um, so in this case, we're actually using the computing power of, of quantum computers. So in this case, quantum computers use qubits, which are actually must fa much faster at calculations because of you know, uh, quantum or properties of, uh, of, of, of quantum mechanics. So in this case, since qubits can go under superposition and go under entanglement, they have much faster calculation or, or at least computation limits or like much larger computation limits and that will allow us to speed up the classification of groups of particles or jets in this case. And we're, we're essentially trying to use quantum computing to speed up this process. And that's like the main objective of our research. So you will run the quantum computing on your local machine? Uh, no, we're gonna, we're gonna utilize the, um, the server cluster from ASDRP and, uh, we're, we're, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna utilize ESGRP server cluster and their their quantum computer quantum computer to actually like run this uh, main algorithm. But we don't have it. quantum computers at ESGRP. I think I think uh, we don't have even Docker at ESGRP servers. I think Dr. McMahon mentioned something about that, uh, or we we had like a quantum computing like cluster here. We have cluster, but I'm not sure it's capable of running. It's it's a it's a server. 
I'm not sure if you can run that one because see, I'm running neuroimaging. I'm, I'm trying to get Docker. So <laughs> if you get Docker, <laughs> install me for me, I'll be very happy. Uh, but yeah, our server have a problem getting Docker installed on it. So I, I don't know like how you are running the challenges. Oh, my oven is burning. So uh, excuse my, okay, I'll be back. You continue. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I I guess uh, Dip uh, Dip Tash, Tanshu has a question. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I had a comment and a question. So, um, re regarding Dr. Jahanikia's question and, and the project itself, um, I think Akash, you you mentioned uh, something about using D Wave. Uh, do you know D Wave does quantum annealing? Is it possible to use D Wave systems to run your thing instead of maybe use JRP's quantum emulator? Uh, it is definitely possible. Uh, we're just looking at this right now because we have at least to research quantum systems a little bit more, but we could definitely use the D Wave system. So. Okay. Um, and I also had a question on um, your like overall, like, uh, modified classification model. So, um, are you are you trying to like are you planning to do um, a classical quantum hybrid approach, or is it going to be a fully quantum approach, or how how is it how is the quantum part going to be uh, embedded within your uh, within your project? So, in this case, the whenever we run a neural network on whatever data that we have we're going to replace the optimization algorithm with uh, quantum annealing in this case. So we would take a hybrid quantum approach, basically. I see. And I'm not exactly sure. So, um, so is there any specific quantum annealing uh, algorithm that you would be using or any quantum optimization that you'd be using? Or um, yeah. uh, Currently, we're just looking at pretty much all types of uh, quantum annealing algorithms. But in this case, we, we still have to sort of develop our methods since we have, have, since we've had about like one month or so to actually research our topic and then actually get everyone up to speed and, and, all, of, uh, and all of that stuff. But yeah, we yeah. have to look into that. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think we will have to think about what type of algorithm we're gonna use. Okay, sounds good. I look forward to hearing more about the project and how it goes. And by the way, excellent slide deck. I really liked it. Thanks. Okay, so my recommendation is that you first make sure that you have everything set. Uh, because I think you have a long way to go looking at what you're looking to do for quantum computing. Okay, uh, so check for like all the resources because, and uh, your data is not a wicked data, is it? It's not a complex data, is, is it multidimensional data? It is, is it big data? yes. Okay, so are you using any um, dimension reduction? What cleaning approaches you're using before you run into neural network? Um, because you, you, is it the raw data? You, are you going to process the data, pre-process the data? Have um, you taken so, a look into data? Yeah, we have, we have taken a look into the data. So okay. in this case, uh, CERN's sort of uh, C CMS Docker instance has a tool which, we, which essentially can look at groups of particles and what types of, uh, or specifically what we're looking at in this case. So uh, we're going to be looking at thrust, which the CMS does show to us, and we're also be we're go, we'll also be going to be looking at uh, color charge, and also they have a lot of information regarding how jets are actually created or jet creation, and we're going to take all of this raw data, which we which we need to definitely do like dimensional dimensionality reduction on, so. This is essentially the data that we have. Uh, we haven't actually gone and sort of pre-processed it, but we do mm -hmm. have 
like a pretty good idea of what we're going to be doing once we actually get all of the data up on the server cluster and actually code something. Yes, absolutely. I would highly recommend you spend plenty of time on pre-processing and cleaning your data and like looking what, um, in, you know, what are the best approach for dimensionality reduction? Uh, because the common mistake is that the moment that people, they get the data, they're just looking into the algorithm to pass it into. And that's the biggest mistake. Like uh, you want to avoid having any noise in your data. And the second thing is that you want to also avoid, um, you know, um, feeding like um, extra feed, overfeeding of your data into your algorithm. Uh, so good luck. I'm excited to hear for uh, about your project. It's definitely exciting. Some of these kind of this project that I um, kind of love to hear. Uh, but again, like I would recommend that uh, looking into your data and also the resources. Very important. Good luck. Yeah. I I would recommend uh, answering maybe a couple of the questions yes. in the chat. I do have one question, but I think uh, after Bab Pav, that would be easy. <laughs> uh, okay, so one of the questions was, did you conduct an efficacy standard study of standard computing's application to jet identification? Um, we did not, but based on like the literature review that we did, um, literature survey we did, we saw that machine learn like the problem that arises from, um, kind of jet identification was the pileup. Um, so using quantum computing, we can kind of just make it run more efficiently. And, um, Akash can jump in on that. Uh, so answering uh, Vaibhub's question, are there a quantum optimization and D-Wave uh, quantum annealing algorithms based out of Python, or are there other languages that you're also investigating? Uh, so when we did a literature review of uh, quantum annealing in, in the case of noise removal, which is like classifying not a noise and non-noise, uh, we, we found studies that have used Python. However, in this case, in the, in the case of uh, whatever information we're actually processing through, uh, or, or like the information from CERN CMS we're actually processing through, we're going to be using uh, C++. And if you know a library from C++, it's called Quantum++, which we will be using to not only process, but actually sort of analyze this data or actually comprehend it in the first place in code. So... Yeah, we may look into Python later, but currently we have an idea of just going with C++. Yeah, and to answer Harsh John's question about can we use Google's quantum computer capacity offered to researchers or institutions, um, as of right now, we're just planning to use our original model on the, the cluster and to sort of like use Docker in order to use the containerized environment. And maybe we can look into that a little bit later. Akarsh, if you have anything to say more on that. Yeah. Um, so we're probably going to be asking uh, Dr. Ruth Mahon about an actual quantum computer that we, we, we can use because the algorithm we're using, either we're going to choose a different one and actually sort of reiterate our, our method, or we are probably more likely going to ask him for resources to actually use a, a, a quantum computer with qubits. And your question regarding Google's quantum computer, we will be considering it, but we still need a bit more of advisory about you know, what, what we're actually gonna use because quantum computing uh, or essentially using a quantum computer is something that we're all new to. So we're doing a bit of more research on actually how to get hold of that equipment. So yeah.
Any any other questions, I guess? So I, I just have like one question. It might be a simple one, but um, you're using classifiers to identify jets. So what, what, what do you mean by that? Maybe I, I misinterpreted uh, the uh, presentation, but like, because you're going to use like an optimization function to, uh, you know, make a more efficient neural network using like quantum computing and see, uh, you know, fast, fast technologies. But um, what, what's an application of like identifying this? Like how, how is this going to uh, like maybe make another field better or like what's, uh, how is that going to work? I think the biggest um, the biggest thing it would help in is like check reconstruction. So we could, um, that would be the most like apparent benefit, um, I would say. Okay, like, like, oh, okay. And the question regarding the gluon, um, like the energy color thing, energy, um, how, how we would be able to, how did CERN tell the color from the energies? Um, I'm not really sure. I would have to look more into that. But I, they have, um, they have different calorimeters but they also have other detectors so i would assume that they're going to use those other detectors to determine the colors yeah and one thing to note is we actually haven't carried out this um, we haven't measured this yet it's just like a proposal of what we're going to do in the future so um we we haven't done this yet Okay, good luck. So we are excited to hear where you'll be ending next term. So definitely come back and give us update. Good luck, good luck, good luck. All right, thank you so much. Wish you best of luck. We're so excited to hear next. Okay, so I think that's the only presentation we have tonight. So have a good night, everyone. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>